Blockchain Show is a podcast that demystifies cryptocurrencies and distributed ledger technology. Hello, welcome back to the Blockchain Show. I'm your host, Ethan Kinderconnect, and thank you for joining me today. Uh, this is episode 213. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome Wesley Tysa. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you very much for being here. There's a lot of interesting information we're going to cover about crypto regulation uh, in the U.S., also in the world, if we have time. You know, Wesley, I, uh, if you'd like to say a little bit to the audience about yourself and how you got into uh, this topic. Yeah, so my background is that I uh, am a management partner of a tax law firm based in Hong Kong. And what I do is uh, help people deal with international regulations that have been passed to uh, deal with uh, yeah, certain ma- tax matters. And through my work, I obviously have a, d- a good insight into international regulations and how they apply to uh, individual countries. And then, uh, yeah, I'm a big fan of crypto already in crypto. Uh, yeah, since 2014, I've been going to meetups. And obviously, yeah, I was on Reddit and I saw a, uh, a publication by FATF, which is an international regulator. And when I read that, I immediately knew what it meant, that it was quite a significant uh, document that's going to... Uh, yeah, force regulations on uh, countries worldwide. And uh, yeah, I made a summary of that and put it on uh, on Reddit and it went viral. And uh, yeah, I guess that's how uh, we got into contact at one point because of that, uh, that post. Yeah, it was just shocking. Uh, it shouldn't have been shocking to me because uh, I, I had the suspicion I just didn't. I just didn't know the details. Um, maybe I was a bit naive to think that we could just keep going on as usual. The ethos of of blockchain was something that I thought was revolutionary, um, both technologically and and the potential for um, for change for individuals. In the U.S., the Biden administration's been talking recently, within the last several weeks, about. Um, you know, kind of clamping down on uh, taxing people who make over, I think, six hundred dollar profit on on uh, Bitcoin, and and that's okay, I suppose. Um, but more troubling with some of the more international powers, if you would say, uh, coming together to kind of keep their interests more aligned. Maybe you could kind of outline some of those um, changes that that might be coming. What uh, what first happened was uh, yeah that I read this guidance from FATF, which is the Financial Action Task Force based in Paris. Uh, they published a paper in March, and uh, yeah, it was quite comprehensive uh, about uh, what uh, could and could not be done in in crypto. Now, to know why this organization has power, it's part of a uh, assignment by the G20. So it has been assigned by the highest level of governments to come up with regulations for crypto. So it's not just uh, looking at the national uh, sphere, but also in the, in, at the international level. And many, uh, for example, currently banks are regulated through uh, yeah, re- uh, recommendations issued by the FATF. So this organization is highly influential and now it's uh, coming for crypto. And yeah, so what they came up, it was like a hundred page documents. And uh, to give you a couple of, couple of examples, they uh, they consider stable coins high risk, uh, so that's uh, that's one of the ish- things they want to focus on. So really uh, clamp down on stable coins, um, and, uh, anonymity enhanced cryptocurrencies. So that's your privacy coins like Monero. Those are likely to be banned because uh, yeah they really uh, obfuscate uh, the sources of money. Um, and uh, yeah, there, now recently, like last month, uh, they issued a final guidance in October, and they added a few things. Uh, one thing about DeFi. And uh, yeah, they consider that most projects they have some uh, entity. So whoever you know launched that uh, the DeFi is going to be considered a uh, VASP, so it's a virtual asset service provider, and he's going to be regulated as a uh, bank. So they need to do uh, KYC and uh, uh, record all sorts of transactions. Um, yeah, so that is sort of like the high level uh, uh, regulations that have come from. Uh, yeah, from the international space. We've kind of seen a few of these, you know, know your customer type things on um, some of the bigger exchanges. The stable coins, it's kind of, uh, it shouldn't be surprising to me, but it is because you would think that that wouldn't be seen as a 
as a it's a risk. It's it's marketed more of of a uh, I guess towards the the everyday person as as a, as a safer bet. Why do you think that a stable coin is viewed as a risk? To understand this, you have to look at it from the perspective of the regulator. So this regulator, their main goal, at least their stated goal, is to prevent money laundering and terrorist financing. The way to do money laundering is to uh, have easy transactions across countries and uh, yeah, to be able to hide the, uh, the, uh, the transactions. Now, uh, in, in that light, they look at, at things differently. They don't look at the stable coin as being a... Uh, you know, a stable coin that has a low risk, they look at it, wait a minute, this uh, this could be uh, a complete financial, uh, new financial system outside of their regulated banks. And for them, uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency, they aren't uh, yet considered money because, uh, yeah, they're so volatile. So in their in their mind, they, they don't really look at crypto as a risk to their, um, yeah, to, uh, to a payment system, but uh, stable coins are. And uh, yeah, this really was kicked off after Libra uh, of, of uh, the coin issued by Facebook in 2018, when they uh, yeah when they published that news that they were going to issue a stable coin uh, that was going to exist outside of the banking system and they have a billion users. Yeah, then the international regulators yeah, got really scared and looked like, oh, wait a minute, this is going to uh, you know create a system which is totally uncontrollable at least by by them. Um, so that's that's what they consider a risk. Okay, yeah, I guess from that point of view, that's perfectly understandable. You know, without being too conspiratorial, you know, sometimes I, I wonder, is there something else going on? You know, like uh, in the U.S., the Patriot Act was told to the public as, you know, that it was going to be all about safety and to protect the American people. But here we are 50 or 20 years later, and it, it's mainly being used to, spy on and, and keep tabs on Americans. But at, on the, the flip side of the coin is, you know, it's probably prevented a, a lot of, I would assume, terrorist attacks and stuff that we don't know about. It's kind of a delicate balance between protecting civil liberties and also keeping countries safe and sovereign. But it just seems like within, you know, the financial elite, there there seems to be a, a tendency to uh, you know, want to hold on to power. And what, do you, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think it's more of, of a trying to hold on to power or is it more of a, are they trying to do the right thing? What, what do you think about that? Um, I think it is, it is a mix of both. Um, yeah, there's all, all, always different actors in uh, in a policy and uh, yeah, an organization like FODF, yeah, they are just uh, trying to prevent money laundering, right? Um, they're, they're not necessarily, they're just a tool in a sense, but yeah, they are, once, once you get these powers in place, just as you said with the Patriot Act, um, th- this can be become a policy tool for uh, for governments or politicians, yeah, to to also use it for other things. Um, to give you an example, in the Netherlands, uh, uh, the government issued a statement on certain uh, alternative media platforms that they uh, incited. Uh, well, your American equivalent would be domestic terrorism, and uh, yeah, what happened is that the financial institutions cancelled their um, their, their accounts so they be, became very difficult for them to operate so um, yeah there's always two sides of the coin as you co- correctly stated and uh, yeah I'm also not blind a lot of these policies that have uh, yeah, certain uh, stated uh, uh, agendas or, or at least goals they are now being used to make almost everything conditional that we're doing in our daily lives and uh, yeah I'm, I'm seeing that I'm, I'm quite worried about it as well yeah that, that makes sense I think you know the working class usually doesn't have a very positive view on um, more of the, the ruling and, and, and elites, whether, whether that may be the political class or the the financial class. It was interesting to read some of those comments on Reddit and, and see just the, the general opinion there. But at the end of the day, what can we really do? I mean, I think it's, it's very difficult to try to regulate Anything blockchain related to begin with, but um, do you think that they're going to be successful in this or are the, um, you know, developers just going to be able to stay one step ahead by just changing the code? Um, I think it's, yeah, again, it's going to be uh, both ways. I mean, one of the things that has really happened at least the last, um, well, four or five years is that blockchain projects have really tried to focus on replacing the financial system and uh, specific functions currently done by the financial system, right? So uh, 
uh, yeah, DeFi is, is, a, is a thing, but also exchanges. So they're really, uh, yeah, they're getting into the regulated activities and they just look using blockchain. Now, uh, yeah, one of the things uh, of the legal system, that they're not necessarily looking at what kind of technology you use, they're just looking at what you're doing. Yeah, so a lot of the current projects that people think that they can can do without uh, without problems, it's it, it going to yeah face a lot of headwinds, including some of the uh, projects uh, specifically mentioned in a in a policy like this, right? For example, mixers or uh, yeah, and then and then, sorry, anonymity and had cryptocurrencies. Um, so those yeah, that could be a little bit pro- problematic. But at the same th- time, uh, yeah, as you said. These laws they, they apply on financial service providers, and yeah, if we move more to a peer-to-peer system, uh, there are no f- financial service providers uh, needed. So yeah, th- that could um, render part of these regulations less uh, less usable. But uh, yeah, it's, it's quite a complex uh, question because it really depends on how will in the future you people use crypto. Yeah, as as they use a DAO, it's really on and off exchanges, right? And uh, there's very few people who are 100% crypto and never uh, think about changing them, changing it back. Um, yeah, so if you have a completely peer to peer economy, these regulations would not apply. But I think that's that's uh, only a small percentage of the uh, of the crypto industry. So for everybody who's in exchange uh, on exchanges, they're going to be, uh, yeah, they will, they will understand what, what what this means for them. You know, it, it's going to change the way crypto operates. Yeah, man, it still feels like the early days of um, cryptocurrency and, and uh, mass adoption of of these technologies, like you know, the other ones that use blockchain. Man, it just kind of like gives me pause to think about all the people who are unbanked. And it's challenging to uh, even get a bank account. You know, that, that was kind of the allure of, of cryptocurrencies was um, being able to to send money to people with, with just your cell phone or mm. yeah, um, exactly. a laptop computer. So, I mean, I, that, that's difficult, man, because... Well, the, the thing what I, what I, uh, I wanted to point out is that, that that specifically is not going to be banned or, uh, or at least not by these regulations. Um, so that is, it, it could be a, uh, and actually a boost for actual peer to peer transactions. What I'm saying, um, what people were trying to before is just trying to replace the bank, but you know, maybe if we could just, uh, focus on the peer to peer part. Yeah. What once the peer to peer really gets off, uh, economy, then it becomes very difficult to regulate at least through these measures. Okay. Well, I hope that makes sense. Yeah. 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 It does make sense. Um, Edward Snowden came out with his leaks about NSA and government overreach and, like how they were literally doing illegal activities to harvest data and spy on people. The sentiment, I think it was like 2013 was, well, if you're not doing anything wrong, you don't, you don't have anything to worry about. And I'm like, yeah, well, that's true. But at the same time, I mean, this is just like a huge overreach into uh, what I would consider human rights. And uh, at the end of the day, like they're going to do it. They're, they're going, you know, it's like for centuries, (laughs) <laughs> they've been able to uh just make things into law or or use their uh their influence to uh to to uh, change those in power's um positions yeah it's just a little a little creepy to see um that it's heading in that direction um i guess we'll have to to wait and find out i mean how much that's actually going to change most most people listening to this show are probably buying and selling cryptocurrency to uh make a profit but there's certainly a core within our audience who are involved with um, some of these projects because they want to help change humanity for the better so um, I, my, my hope is that those projects can can still go on unhindered and you know things like freezing assets of, of some some of these startups and uh, it's just uh I don't know. I don't really know where I'm going with that, other than this uh, this concern that I have. Do you, do you think that's that's uh, a warranted concern, or, or do you think that things are going to be okay? Yeah. So it really depends on what a startup is doing, right? I think the days. I mean, it, it's not going to be past a couple of months, but somewhere 2023, we you probably see the changes coming. But yeah, I think the days are kind of gone that you just yeah you start an ICO from the back from your from your basement, right? And uh, yeah, do whatever you want. Just start a DeFi, launch launch a website that that performs banking activities. Um, yeah, so in that sense, uh, yeah, some of that will will 
face some uh, consequences. But uh, at the same time, governments do uh, have to abide by laws, and certain laws they are uh, could be beneficial at, at the same time, right? When when something is treated as property, for example, as Bitcoin and Ethereum uh, could be, uh, according to a new proposal, it, they will have a lot of protection as well, right? So they cannot uh, be banned the next day. So uh, yeah, th- there's two things to this uh, to this re- to these regulations, and uh, yeah, it really depends on uh, yeah the kind of activities people employ that what what kind of consequences they will face. Now, I, I personally am always quite flexible in my uh, in my dealing with regulations to just uh, find a way around it or, or things like that. But I understand that uh, not everybody has that luxury. So yeah, it's it's a bit difficult to say. For, for I mean, there's definitely going to be projects that. Uh, uh, and activities that we consider normal now that at one point uh, uh, will be problematic. For example, even just sending uh, the money to your exchange from your own wallet, right? What these regulations uh, require of, of uh, entities, such for example, as, such as Coinbase, is for them to verify who the uh, who, who the wallet owns, uh, who owns the wallet that the, that the money is sent to, you know, and they have to uh, to record these kind of things. So yeah, there's going to be much more uh, transparency in that sense and much more monitoring. Yeah, I think that that's inevitable at this point. Uh, my hope is that it can be done by um, by the people. You know, maybe someone listening that's already working on a project that, that can uh, provide that service. It just it just seems like government tends to ruin things and, and make them slow and ineffective. And in, in the technological space, that's that's often very detrimental. Well, there is one thing that I can. Uh conclusion that we have to make. I mean, if uh, regulated entities uh, have to verify who you are sending the money to, the money, the, the transaction speed is going to decline because they have to, uh, yeah, they, they have to perform some sort of checks or you need to uh, get an approved address before you can send it. I don't know how it exactly will play out, but it's going to be uh, uh, less easy to, uh, as compared to just using your own wallet and sending it to someone else. Um, and then one one more point to your further uh, your previous uh, statement is that it's not necessarily uh, government agencies that are going to uh, enforce this. So that's a little bit the uh, uh, yeah the sneaky part. I think you will see you see it in a lot of uh, other things uh, as well, right? Like for example, the uh, uh, stores are now to uh, need to enforce like the uh, a vaccine the check or example. You know, it's pri- private parties. Uh, uh, checking other private parts, so it's sort of outsourcing of police work. And um, yeah, if you look at uh, so so the exchanges are going to have to monitor these transactions and store the data. And then if there is a, speci- uh, a suspicious transaction, then they report it to the authorities. Uh, so it's not necessarily the government it gets involved in all transactions. It's just that they force certain regulations on the people who perform these transactions to uh, to be able to to get the uh, information if they need it. Okay, yeah, I follow. So when we were, you were talking earlier about uh, virtual asset service providers, are we talking, um, I would assume, like you said, exchanges, but is this going to cover things like NFTs and uh, some newer forms of uh, assets that haven't really been invented yet? Or what are your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, so the, the, the virtual asset service provider, the definition of that has been uh, yeah, made, made very, very broad. The idea behind is that they really want to yeah, cover everything that happens in the crypto space. If it, if there is a uh, central uh, party involved, so whoever facilitates the trades, uh, that party could be considered a VASP and, and as such, that needs to be regulated. So that person needs to get a license and, uh, you know, uh, do KYC and things like that. So it's a quite broad definition. Um, but yeah, it, it is a specific service provider. So if it, you have to look at it as a middleman. So if you are a uh, buying an NFT, well, maybe buying an NFT could be considered a, uh, you know, if you, if you get it on a uh, specific exchange, maybe that exchange needs to be regulated. But the, the buying of the NFT itself is not going to be uh, uh, considered a uh, fast uh, activity. Here. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit more about the peer-to-peer transactions. Um, that's something that for many folks has been a kind of a lifeline for um, avoiding remittances. And um, like you mentioned, there are a few people listening to this podcast who do operate solely on cryptocurrency, which not 
still not easy to do in 2021, but they are out there. What changes might be coming to those people who are sending transactions only to other wallets without the uses of uh, an exchange? Yeah, so the interesting thing uh, about it is that, uh, for example, these regulations, they apply to financial service providers. And if you don't use financial service providers, these regulations don't apply to you. So as of now, uh, in all the laws that I have seen, uh, this whole activity of someone being completely into crypto is not something that uh, that is going to be uh, regulated, at least as of now. So the way that they hope to achieve uh, their oversight is that they, first of all, regulate all the uh, exchanges yeah, and then make it very difficult. I think that's that's... That's not clear yet, but I think the next step is going to be then to make it very hard to uh, to use, uh, to wire money from and to exchanges from uh, unregulated, unhosted wallets, that's how they call it. Um, so yeah, if someone is completely out of the system, that uh, this regulation doesn't cover it, so they can set, send the money to whoever they want. Uh, but yeah, do know that at one point, if they need to buy something, let's say a house, maybe the one who receives the money, they need to do a check, where did you get the funds, you know, uh, these kind of things, uh, uh, source of funds reports, things like that. Um, so, yeah, it's relatively easy to uh, to be completely out of the system because none of this covers it. But uh, yeah, if, if you at one point have to go into the system, maybe at one point they get, uh, get involved with that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it seems like a powerful way to um, stay in control of, of world affairs. Thinking about Afghanistan and, and just a few headlines I've seen, about their uh, I, I central bank and um, you know their assets being freezed over in different countries. I mean, it's it's a very powerful tool to be able to just freeze a country's assets like that and uh, creating sanctions, uh, economic sanctions. So I could see why cryptocurrency could be seen as such a big threat. The more libertarians people might think that that's it shouldn't happen. Uh, you know, it should all be. You know, like the, the the free market type mentality, but that's just not the world that we live in. Um, I mean, I don't. Obviously, Afghanistan was kind of a a tough issue for a lot of people. I mean, many countries over the centuries have had dealings there, and it's um, you know, it just kind of makes me sad, really, because I used to hear uplifting stories about women in Afghanistan or or other uh, countries in the Middle East who literally couldn't work like they couldn't get paid but they they found some way to make a living through cryptocurrency so i just hope that 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 option is still available for people who are in oppressed countries because if i just my fear is that this this might actually end up hurting them while the outside powers are, are trying to you know keep their people safe they they might be hurting the the people who are um in those countries and are currently not safe so well i can give you a very uh yeah, a realistic example of exactly what you're saying. I used to work in Dubai. We helped in entrepreneurs set up businesses in, you know, whatever. If they want to move to Dubai and set up a company, you know, and uh, own a bank account. And, uh, yeah, once this regulations passed, because this, is, this first came to banking, right? And, um, yeah, when it came to banking, uh, the first thing that happened, everybody who had business in Africa was simply kicked out because it was considered a high risk. And it's, uh, yeah, as of now, it's, it's very difficult for uh, anybody, uh, well, especially in Africa, but almost outside of re- uh, the Western world and a few financial centers, it's very difficult to accept credit cards or to, uh, you know, to have a bank account. So that problem is real. And that's partly because of these regulations. It's, it is too expensive to, uh, and too high risk uh, to, uh, to have these kind of clients. And uh, yeah, to, further to your previous uh, statement, uh, yeah, it is indeed also true that uh, these financial institutions are being used, uh, yeah, to sanction people and to enforce policy, and that is, uh, yeah, it's not the idea of, of having a uh, uh, a bank account, right? Uh, it should be just for us to be able to, uh, yeah, pay for our things. But it's definitely uh, true that I see a lot of laws are being enforced through the financial system, to just or at least the risk of, be, of your asset being frozen, things like that. Um, so, yeah, that's a, tr- a tremendous tool for governments to enforce their policies. And, uh, yeah, that's not, not likely that they want to give that up. Well, makes sense, I guess. It, it's a strange feeling to go out and, and purchase something and know it's being tracked or, or say something on the phone and know it's being listened to. 
I, I guess people are just kind of used to it now being on social media and just many folks just put their whole lives out there. But there's certainly individuals who want to maintain a level of privacy for whatever personal reasons they may have. So it's just, uh, I don't know, I guess that's just the way of the world. But, you know, it's such, it's such potential of of good for mankind that blockchain can bring. I, I uh, My hope is that it will continue in that direction and that the uh, the ethos of Satoshi Nakamoto will uh, will live on maybe in a different form. I think it will. Yeah, I hope so because, I mean, that kind of all started around the 2008 financial housing crisis and, and all the bailouts. And in this country, we saw, you know, huge companies that were doing dastardly deeds, getting away with it, and then rewarded with uh, government bailouts while the people ended up having to pay back all of that essentially through through taxes. And <laughs> it's just such a messed up system here where we're never going to get out of debt. It's just bizarre to me that um, that's how the world keeps working. And then when I think about, you know, the U.S. dollar and and oil and how how it's been used to uh, influence other countries economic policies and even their um uh, political direction um i just uh i i don't know maybe i was naive i was thinking that uh blockchain you know defi and, and crypto could be a, a a means to kind of lift us up and out of that old world legacy system of control in, into a new era where um you know, everyone could be prosperous, but I guess we'll see. I think they have their work cut out for them, uh, to be honest with you. But uh, it's they, they've been kind of. I shouldn't say the word they because that that sounds very like conspiratorial. But uh, yeah, the powers that be have had time to to think about this. So yeah, yes and no. I mean, at the same time, it's also this this market is uh, or these yeah the, the cryptos are moving very very fast, probably much faster than that. Uh, uh, anyone would have guessed, uh, at least anyone uh, in power, right? I mean, if you do PSG in uh, monetary policy, then the uh, cryptocurrency doesn't make any sense. So they just don't look at it as money. Uh, but yeah, there is now millions of people who actually look at it as money, as, as an alternative. And um, I agree that our system uh, is now uh, yeah, it's going to be some sort of reset coming, I think. Uh, there has to be some sort of... Uh, reshuffling of the cards, I think. And um, yeah, and the more unstable it becomes, uh, the more uh, attractive Bitcoin becomes. And uh, you can see that in uh, alternative country or yeah, sort of like uh, peripheral countries like uh, El Salvador, but also in Turkey and uh, uh, you know, for Venezuela. For those people, you know, it, it could be an option. And, and I think in Lebanon, I read something and uh, uh, Palestine that they're going to try to use it. Um, so in that sense, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the system is in such a way, also with all this control and everything, it also makes it expensive, you know, and, and slow. And uh, yeah, the, the, the peer to peer uh, system becomes more and more attractive, actually, also the, the more it becomes regulated and oppressed, uh, like the, the existing financial system. Um, so it's going to be very interesting how it all plays out. But uh yeah, it's not that now after one uh, law has been passed that uh, that crypto is dead. That's definitely not the case. Um, yeah, there's a couple of loopholes in it also. So, uh, yeah, I'm not, uh, as of now, um, yeah, I, th I think there's still a good future for crypto for sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it is promising. Um, I think that uh, one of the huge pains is of uh, banking if someone's broke is overdraft fees and uh it, it's almost like a tax on the poor you know if, if someone's not having enough money the, the bank's going to charge them money uh and yet if someone is wealthy they're going to make money off the interest in their um account so uh I, I, yeah, that's I, not going to change with, with bitcoin i think <laughs> i mean yeah, if, if you spend bitcoin that you don't owe your da -da -da, i think the interest rate's going to be even higher yeah, that's crazy. I wish I could go back in time. And uh, a few years ago, I, I was on this this uh, path to only use Bitcoin as a, as a currency, and uh, I was I was paying for for services and uh, you know small stuff like uh, music lessons, stuff of that sort. And 
what was I thinking? I should have just kept on, to, held on to it. But that, I mean, the intention was to have it be a, a currency and it's not really, not really taken off that way. My music teacher is probably doing pretty well right now. So good for him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. But I mean, there's a lot of uh, other encouraging projects coming out. There's definitely people are getting excited about, you know, some of the meme coins coming around like Shiba Inu and Doge had its day several months ago. Ethereum is just constantly rising and amazing me. It's uh, some of the projects being built off of that. And then we've seen other projects built off of the Ethereum blockchain. And so, I mean, it's still an exciting time. I, I think that, uh, you know, when when I first read your article, I I thought, oh man, it's over. <laughs> like we had a good run, but uh, the more I talk to you, I think that uh, you know, there's there's still it's more of a hiccup in in, in the or, or a bump in the road, as they say. Um, just just another thing, you know, more more uh, hoops to go through. It's it's not necessarily going to kill the industry, but uh, it, it's definitely going to change it. I mean, do you think that's a fair? assumption or, or or should i be more concerned no i think that's a fair uh, assessment but just yeah just keep in mind that certain activities i mean uh now for, from a regulated uh, re- regulation point of view you cannot just uh you know uh, collect money and uh, start a company with it you know those are regulated activities uh you know securities or any kind of, 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 of similar regulations um the same as providing banking services the same as taking money and invest it for someone and uh, yeah, I just see a lot of people in the in the crypto space are ju- who are just generally unaware of the regulatory framework that's already in existence, and they just assume that because it's crypto, they can do whatever they want, and uh, they come up with things like code is law, free speech, and things like that. Um, but yeah, that's not how it works. If you prefer perform a certain activity, it doesn't matter matter what kind of uh, technology you use, and that is something people have to understand, I think, a bit better. Uh, so that certain projects that they are going to, uh, you know, they they're going to face headwinds, and also what happened, for example, to Ripple, I think that's going to happen to another a couple of more companies. Uh, yeah, there's going to be an assessment, at least uh, according to some proposed regulations uh, that's currently in the in the US, and they're going to look at the top 25 coins in market cap and see if uh, if any of them are considered securities, and so they're going to. Yeah, do the same thing as Ripple to try to regulate them and have them, uh, yeah, within the system, right? Um, and then trading is only allowed at, at, at regulated exchanges. So yeah, there's definitely that going on. But at the same time, uh, yeah, people building kind of new kind of projects or this NFT stuff. There's a lot of that going to be outside of these uh, regulations because they are not uh, financial services. And that's the, the big distinction, I think. I think the next move should be away, uh, you know, f- from uh, by the industry to move more into that direction of peer-to-peer economy, uh, economic just interaction, economic interaction, which is not regulated uh, by current regulations. And yeah, if, they, if that will be regulated, that that is sort of like, uh, as you said, as you really mentioned, uh, just a really invasive in, in just everyday people, everyday lives, right? Um, so yeah, I think. It, the crypto should move more into the, the peer-to-peer economy and just uh, a facilitator of, of basic human behavior. And uh, yeah, if, if, if that move is being made, I think there's a big uh, big uh, future for, for crypto. But if people are just going to keep their money exchanges and yeah, hope for uh, to be uh, be rich, uh, yeah, then this, this is going to be all brought into the fold. Yeah, that, that's, that's very well said. Reminds me of the importance of having a, a good lawyer on your side because many people have said ignorance of the law does not exempt you from the consequences of it. So, um, I mean, even before any regulation got into the industry, there was still a a big need for having a a legal team or, um, an attorney you can talk to uh, because I mean, people, you gotta cover your ass as they say. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, um, Let's let's talk about some different people uh, in the space and, and their and their different associations with it. So, we'll start with investors who maybe already have a portfolio of cryptocurrencies. Do you think that there might be any uh, adversity that might be coming their way? Any anything they can do to protect their assets? 
Well, yeah. So if you are an investor in crypto, that's not a yeah, it's, it's not a banned activity, right? So you're allowed to buy cryptos. So in that sense, it's not uh, something that they should worry about. But yeah, if you have specific coins that that become uh, yeah focus of regulators, that could have a price effect, right? So for example, if you look at Ripple, uh, the moment that they, I think it was a dollar, and the moment uh, they got sued, or at least XRP, right? Uh, the Ripple got sued. Uh, it's one of the companies that is the main uh, supplier of uh, of XRP. Then that that co- that coin dropped to like twenty cents. So that's like an eighty percent drop. If I'm correct, it could be. Uh, Something like that. So yeah, that that could uh, yeah. So, so people should keep an eye on that if they have specific coins that could at one point be uh, the focus of regulators. And um, yeah, it's a bit difficult to say which coins that are going to be. I mean, there's as I mentioned, there's a new uh, act uh, proposed in Congress, and then there they look at uh, uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum as commodities. So those would be out of the scope of the SEC. But any other coin as potentially uh, could be considered a security. Um, so that is something I think that could uh, people could look at at one point. That's not going to be decided now. That's going to take uh, at least a year or so. But yeah, keep an eye on that. The other thing is uh, yeah, specific coins like privacy coins. Yeah, I like the idea of privacy coins. Uh, I think they're very important. But at the same time, the governments don't like them. And for example, in the new um, yeah, act that is being uh, proposed, as I just mentioned, um, Privacy coins are actually added to the Bank Secrecy Act, which uh, put it on the same level as uh, uh, structuring and uh, tax evasion and things like that. So you you could actually go uh, get significant problems uh, with the government, both uh, in terms of fines and yeah, if you deliberately try to hide your money, we use privacy coins. Uh, it could be even be jail time. So uh, yeah, those, those laws have not been passed, but that's that's at least the way they, uh, the governments are looking at it. So. Uh, that's another thing to to look at. Um, yeah, and if a stable coin gets targeted by uh, by regulators, that could be a problem also. Yeah, I guess that's uh, that's sort of my take on it. It's a little bit difficult to see because um, none of it is passed in law, but I think that's sort of the gist of it. To all the entrepreneurs listening, um, you know, we we talked a little bit about that already. But uh, might there be any other activities that they need to analyze that might bring them any risk? Well, yeah, if they if they provide financial services, they, then they can expect that that at one point they could they are considered a VASP, so they might need to do KYC or things like that. So that could be a, a potential risk. Uh, if you're just an entrepreneur and you accept Bitcoin as payment, that is as of now not uh, not covered or anything. So it, yeah, it really depends on the type of activity, and that's that's yeah, really something your listeners, I guess, should, should understand it. Yeah. You, if you perform a regulated activity and do it through crypto, uh, you you still might uh, have to be regulated. Yeah, that's interesting. I know that uh, I was thinking about Tesla the other day, and they I think they produce like one percent of the cars. Um, I don't know if that's globally or in the U.S., but yet they're valued at way more than most of the top. Uh, car producers combined, and and I wonder if that doesn't have something to do with them buying a bunch of Bitcoin last year, just something I've been thinking about. Yeah, I don't know. The, the, the price of, of Tesla has been surprised me for a very long time. So uh, I, I think part of it also has to do is that they are considered a interesting investment for institutions who now all have to um, invest according to environmental standards. And yeah, there are, there are not many companies that are then uh, – available right so i think that's also part of the demand yeah that's so it's in a way it's very risky money because it's as you said it's highly overvalued in terms of its earnings so if we ever get proper earnings yeah, tesla is going to uh, see some down uh, downturns i guess but yeah i mean people have been trying to look rationally at tesla for a very long time and all of them have been wrong so <laughs> i'm definitely not, not gonna make any predictions on that uh, end. yeah Man, this is such an interesting time, and you've been in in some pretty pretty interesting places. And um, you mentioned earlier that uh, you know that you are helping you know some of these uh, institutions or maybe investors um, through your consultancy work. What's what's kind of the uh, the trend that you're noticing in that part of the world in regards to not only regulation but just the uh, embracement of some of these blockchain technologies. 
anything you'd like to comment on? Yeah, especially places like Dubai, they are very sensitive to these kind of regulations uh, because none of these countries, they, they could be at the, re at the receiving end of uh, yeah, what happens if you don't comply with, uh, with the big boys, right? Um, so yeah, they, they are enforcing these regulations pretty much. And, and Dubai, for example, has, 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 uh, yeah, has come up with quite uh, strong regulations on Bitcoin already, uh, or at least uh, activities yeah, for already a couple of years. So they're really at the forefront of it. Uh, and they're trying to attract um, crypto uh, yeah, entrepreneurs to that. And obviously Dubai is interesting because there's uh, no income tax. So for people starting a business, uh, yeah, it could be interesting in that uh, in that uh, perspective. Um, what was your, the second part of your question? You know, in Asia, uh, what's your kind of a, your feel for the the industry there? Um, something that I know China, I think they outright banned. I don't know if it's all cryptocurrencies or or Bitcoin, which I always thought, how do you do that? That seems very difficult. That's like. One of our guests in the past said trying to uh, boil the ocean, <laughs> which I thought was kind of funny. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we saw a, a huge rise in, in Bitcoin's uh, mining in other countries like the U.S. because of that. So uh, I didn't really have anywhere I was going with that, mainly just if, if you had any any uh, any insight into what what the industry is looking like in that part of the world. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, if I would, I would say um, it, it, crypto is definitely uh, people are definitely interested in, in uh, yeah in crypto here in Asia, but it's less of an ide ideological framework. I think it's more as a means of business and and uh, yeah, a way to make money and to 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 do new things. Yeah, and, and so in that sense, I think it's. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. It, it, the, the market is, is, is a little bit different in that sense, but it's definitely also uh, interesting. And yeah, there's also countries like Singapore who, who are looking at this. Yeah, this is a really good uh, development, you know, and they, they potentially look to profit from it. Um, yeah, so it's, it's definitely, yeah, the, the thing is in Asia, obviously it's such a diverse country, right? I'm so sorry, continent, that for example, a place like, uh, uh, yeah, like Singapore is really open to it, and a place like China, they they're really afraid of it. Um, so yeah, you really see a little bit the uh, the underlying uh, assumptions of the country. You know, of countries that are have always been friendly to uh, to uh, capital, they they are welcome it, and uh, the, the more repressive countries, they are uh, they're not too welcoming to it. And um, yeah, if you look at, for example, Southeast Asia, there is a lot of. Um, people who move there in a way who are sort of like active in crypto, but it's all a little bit, yeah, under the, wouldn't say under the radar, but it's not really regulated in a sense. It's not really open. Uh, it's just there. And uh, you see, so, so it's sort of like, it's not like it's really changing, it's going to change the economy anytime soon. Well, whereas, uh, yeah, as you see now in the U S there's a lot of people who are really starting big businesses and big uh, exchanges and really want to change things. Right. Um, so yeah, that sense, I think it's a little bit different. I don't know if it answers your question, but it was, it was a bit out of the. Yeah, well, um, man, this has been uh, really, really a good talk. I know that um, started out, I was a little concerned. Um, the more we talk, it's put me a little bit more at ease. But uh, you know, knowledge is key here, so I think um, many folks listening might be affected more than others. But um, it's it's you know it's important to. Uh, to be aware. So I, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast, share some of this with us. Um, you know, I, uh, you know, so, um, yeah, if there's any, uh, any final thoughts you'd like to, uh, to leave us with about, uh, you know, what to do next or, or just any, anything you'd like to comment on and, in, in, in your work. Yeah. So, so one of the things I do, uh, uh, would like to, to uh, comment on is that, uh, yeah, I share some of the worries that you have uh, in terms of uh, yeah where this is all headed, and uh, I prefer to have a fully peer-to-peer -peer economy, even though uh, yeah that's not probably not what the regulators want. But I will be uh, yeah trying to, to come up with some reports on that sense how what people can and cannot do, and how they uh, you know how they can just uh, prepare themselves so they they stay within the law, but at the same time they they 
uh, yeah, try to keep up, uh, to uphold some of the values of uh, original Bitcoin. Uh, so yeah, if people want to fo uh, follow me on Twitter, I am an at the central dash law, uh, underscore law, and I will publish uh, some uh, documents there. Uh, yeah, probably in the, in the next year. Also, once we have a little bit more, uh, if we know a little bit better what the regulations are, then we also know what we can do and we cannot do. Uh, yeah, and I guess that's uh, that's a good start. And I'm also working on a private legal system for um, yeah things like NFTs and stuff like that. So I'll be publishing on that uh, as well. And I've been very inspired by uh, yeah this whole industry, and I'm trying to move more into it and uh, provide some. Uh, Further understanding, not just just telling people what can and cannot be done, but also trying to work on solutions, right, and help people uh, guide this uh, new space. So that's sort of like my mission for the next year. So uh, if people are interested in that, just follow me and uh, see if that's uh, for, of value for them. Yeah, definitely. I encourage uh, the listener to do that because I've certainly enjoyed reading your writings. Uh, it's very well well worded and uh, hugely insightful. So. Um, yeah, man. Thanks for, for doing all that you do out there. And, uh, you know, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast. It's been a, a real pleasure talking with you. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me.